All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of our monthly game design roundtable discussion. Each month, myself along with our panel here, will discuss a topic relating to game dev or game design. And we are always asking for more topics from the audience. If you have any questions for us along the way, feel free to leave them in the chat. But Tim is still MIA at the moment, and we have found a new guest to kind of take his place and maybe come on for future ones as well. And I'll let him introduce himself in a minute. But as always, for the new people watching, I'll give our roundtable a chance to kind of go around and introduce themselves. So uh, Tomo, why don't you lead things off? Hi, um, I'm glad to be back. My name is Tomo Moriwaki. Um, I'm the kind of the design side founder of a small dev studio called Hyperkinetic Studios that we founded about seven years ago. I've been a game designer for about 24-ish years, and probably my big claim to fame is uh, being creative director on the Spider-Man 2 title from 2004. Oh, and uh, our, my studio has one internal game that is on Steam Early Access called Epic Tavern. Cool game. <laughs> All right, Jack, feel free. Uh, I'm Jack Mamias. I'm currently the director at Impeller Studios, and we're working on a hardcore space combat sim called In the Black. And my background is uh, I've been in the game industry making games professionally since... 1995, started Activision, worked on the Mech Warrior franchise, uh, Heavy Gear fran Heavy Gear 2 franchise, eventually found myself at Crytek, where I was lead designer of Far Cry, lead designer of Crisis. I was at Midway Games before it exploded, <laughs> and now I am uh, teaching game design and making independent games on the site. All right, and uh, introducing uh, Richard, go right ahead. Hello, I'm uh, Richard Carrillo, Game Design and UX Community Director at Ubisoft Toronto, also a Game Director at Ubisoft Toronto. I've got uh, 15 years experience, uh, some of the bigger titles, Spitter Cell Blacklist, Dead Space, Dead Space 2 that I've worked on. Um, and I've done three GDC talks, uh, I, I usually do them every two years, all focused around how to be a su successful game designer in the industry. And that's led me to try and start writing a new book called The Game Designer Handbook. Um, and if you want to follow along the conversation, you can check out the Game Designer Handbook community at uh, Facebook or LinkedIn. All right. And Sharky. And I'm Sharky slash Jim Takersley, and I am the CEO of Nexus Games, a little studio that is just starting up, currently working on Project Triad, which hopefully will be the next big hit of card games coming out in the future. And uh, <laughs> been doing been doing game design since uh, 2004, but only been professional since like 2015. <laughs> All right, and I guess I should actually introduce myself for any new people wondering who this guy is in the bottom left. But I am Josh Blaser, the owner of Game Wisdom. I've been covering game design and the industry for now going on eight years through Game Wisdom. I am currently a two-time author on game design with Game Design Deep Dive Platformers and 20 Essential Games to Study. And I'm currently wrapping up my third book looking at the roguelike genre. And of course, I am the owner of this lovely channel that you're watching right now. And at some point, Richard, we need to have a uh, separate podcast, so I want to talk to you all about Dead Space, because there's a whole lot I want to <laughs> ask about that. We don't have the time here. <laughs> sounds but, good, sounds good. But for tonight, we're talking about a topic that is definitely close to my heart, and I'm sure to everyone here as well, and that is how do you teach game design? And this is something that... I feel like I always say this in my presentations, and this will actually be part of my first question for the panel here, that I started doing game wisdom back in 2012, and I started writing my blog back in 2008, and it felt like for the longest time there really wasn't any kind of mainstream talk or appreciation of game design. Even to this day, there are times where I will look up a topic, thinking that maybe somebody has talked about this. And the only thing that comes up is myself talking about this topic three to four years ago. And I can't necessarily quote myself as a source for my own articles. So, sure you can. 
Sweet. <laughs> nice. There you go. That's what I'm going to do in my book. Josh says, Josh says that this is good. <laughs> but <laughs> my, my question for everyone is, especially with people who've been studying design and teaching it and like offering advice, do you think kind of the understanding or the appreciation of game design has grown or has changed at all in recent years? And anyone can uh, feel free to start things off. I, I uh, think that it it has changed, but I don't think it's it's to the level that it should be at, kind of thing. Like I think I I remember many years ago when when I said I was a game designer, and everybody pretty much laughed it off and said, we don't need an idea guy kind of thing. And and it seemed like all the game designers were getting dismissed as idea guy. You know, mind you that a lot of them were actually idea guys and not actual game designers. But it seemed like everybody got dismissed and the only way to remotely get anywhere as a game designer is to get somewhere as another position, an artist, a musician or something to try to work your way in that way. And I don't think it's a night and day change from that, but I think it's gotten better than it once was. Well, you know, something I think that's worth noting is in recent times, well, fairly recent, like let's say five, seven years, uh, we've I think we've finally done the transition where where the academic side of game design progress is is it holds hands with the with the professional side of game design progress i think i think before that the two were so deeply separated that uh, you you know you could probably you could name off all the people that were kind of connected to both and uh and since then i think you get a much better probably a better education in the university side of things uh and then you probably get more designers that have some understanding of what's going on on the academic side of things yeah, I would say it's definitely increasing. Um, I've been teaching now since 2008, and our department grows every year. And when I began, um, we were one of the smaller departments, but now we're one of the biggest departments, and it, 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 it keeps getting bigger every year. And uh, I mean, we were a young industry, truthfully, and now we're not even beginning to come into our own. We're just still at the, I would say, the end of the beginning and uh, certainly I think people are starting to take what we do seriously which is definitely different from about 10 years ago I think uh, from my perspective um, yes 100% in terms of game design as as a field as as uh, a process uh, we've we've definitely grown as an industry and especially with all the universities now teaching game design as a craft um, I think where we still have a lot of room to grow is uh, the understanding of the game designer, which mm -hmm. I, is not just a field, it's a vocation, it's a career, it's 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 a role on a team. Um, and that's something still uh, working with the universities around me to try and figure out how to teach better because there's a lot of soft skills, um, a lot of collaboration, a lot of teamwork. And even in universities themselves, um, people are surrounded by other game designers. They're not surrounded by uh, rendering engineers. They're not surrounded by animators. They're not surrounded by all these different fields that think differently and don't communicate through game design uh, type of terms. Um, so it's, it's extremely important to, to, I guess, learn the soft skills, learn the team structure, understand the role and the career more than just uh, the craft as well. well and to add to that, I would say if you can't explain it, you don't actually know it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think to Richard's point, there's a really good way to build off of that, that there is a difference between, you know, game design or, you know, trying to establish what the role of a game designer is. Because as Shark said a minute ago, there is that misconception for a lot of people that game designer is, I'm the idea guy, I'm just going to tell everyone around me, you build this level, you design this mechanic, and, you know, I collect all the awards and the uh, accolades, but well, yep. we're actually getting into the point where it's becoming very specialized. I mean, if you look at it from a high level, there's two types of game designers. There's a programmer designer, which is a systems designer, mm -hmm. uh, and they have to be a scripter. And then there's an artist designer that's a level designer. And certainly, we we're training people in in those elements. Um, 
a general, like I would call it uh, a general game designer who might be doing um, writing game design documents and uh, doing things like that. Uh, where I think a lot of people would think that's that's the classic game designer, mm-hmm. that that's the hard one to peg down, and that's the hard one to become because generally everybody wants to be that on the team: the lead yeah. programmer, the lead producer, the lead artist. Everybody wants to be that, and you're gonna you're gonna be fighting them, you know, fighting them in a way to to be running that position. And uh, it's tough. It's it's certainly tough to train at that position. I think more testers than anybody get you know roll up that area. But uh, you know, I think we're definitely going down specialized routes for game designers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think I would agree that like for myself, like people have been asking me for a while now if I should ever like go into a classroom and try to teach an online course on this stuff, and it's something that I definitely want to do. But again, as one of the reasons why I. Th- I don't want to do this discussion. It's hard to actually sit down and say, excuse me, say, how do you teach game design? Because again, as I'm sure everyone here is well aware of, there is no such thing as the one size fits all approach. Every genre is different, every design is different. And for every you know major success that followed a pattern, we can easily point to games that completely, you know, broke their own rules, did something completely uniquely different, and went on to massive success because of it. Well, I mean, I think that there are there is an intersection at the very foundation of things where all game development is going to have similarities. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to kind of. I'll just say it in one sentence. It's the, you know, what do you start with? You're going to bring a designer on board. What are you going to explain? And if you go all the way to the beginning, you have to say that you're designing an experience. You need to understand what someone is going through. And that's going to be maybe because we're making games and games have these users that are fundamentally accustomed to certain types of games, that you need to understand them well enough to make that the choices you make uh, have to evoke a response from them. You're building something that they're partially expecting. You're you're getting to know somebody or you're leveraging the fact that you already know somebody. I do think that this is probably true of all creative fields, or at least potentially true. You're allowed to not give a crap what people think. Um, But at its core, you know, you're like, someone's going to have this experience and I'm going to explain what that experience is like. And if I can't convince you that it's a good call, then we do something different maybe. Mm -hmm. I think from my perspective, I mean, we've talked about... um, the different specializations and and yeah, a hundred percent, Tomo. It's it's uh, we're all making exp- an experience, and I think from my perspective, um, I, I've noticed four different types of designers uh, that I've engaged with that that think differently than me, um, that I try to understand and I fail at for years, um, and. I mean, to me, the, the major components of a game are, are the, the fantasy, the mechanics, the systems, and sort of the structure of the game itself. And those four components I've seen designers really champion and own. And to me, those, it kind of, what I've seen as the four major uh, perspectives of game design, some who start very emotion-driven in terms of what experience they want to make, um, where, you know, games like Journey start very much with what we want players to feel. Mm-hmm. Um, then there's uh, mechanics, how does the gameplay actually feel? There's systems, or how do we want to challenge the player? And then the structure, what is the core game loop? Um, and me, I start more on the structure side, and I have game designers I work with who start at different areas. And those are the areas we ask ourselves questions all the time on, on, on okay, we have a problem to solve. They come at it from that perspective on solving that problem. Um, so overall, it's, 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 it's a tough question of, of how we teach this, um, because everyone, of course, will come from their own perspective, um, and they're not wrong. Um, they, they, it's, it's okay to, to not start toying around and building a mechanic if you want to talk about emotions and story-driven experience. It's, it's, it's okay to come at it from any w- angle you want. And I found a lot of studios, um, a lot of universities, of course, they, they teach one track um, because they found that's what's successful for them. Um, but it, I'm, I'm trying to figure out more how to be more open and teach uh, uh, almost mo- more what Tomo was saying, which is like, get to that experience. What's the experience you want to create? And then let's find it. By the way, that reminds me of a joke we used to tell at Treyarch, where if we could just choose who the senior design roles that were that were going to be on a project, we would that the idea is we'd have a person who is the lead vibe designer, the lead rhythm <laughs> designer, the lead um, uh, emotion designer, and the 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 lead um, if we had a better word, but you know, long term timing and patterns yeah. developer, <laughs> and the we. 
we like to use that on the producers because they would not understand what we were saying. Um, that said, I totally agree with what you're saying. Um, I just, I think you could say though that a designer needs to understand all of those categories. And it could be four categories, two categories, 20 categories. Uh, the teaching of it is these are all the categories that you need to have some mastery and knowledge over. Inevitably, you can't help but have a certain per per point of view inside yeah. that space. Generally, you're going to prioritize one because that's the one that, that you enjoy the most or works for you the most. Uh, but 100%, you should understand them all and be able to work with people that prioritize different ones and come at it from different angles. Yeah, Especially so you can communicate with the other people who will have an affinity, right? Like. You can't get away from understanding story because you're going to make someone responsible for story and you need to have uh, an understanding of the of, of someone who has an affinity for story. Yep. Yeah, and I think the design has a lot, you know, is really impacted by the story and the, the two really need to mesh well together. Mm -hmm. And you can tell when they aren't. And I think well, that is a... Categorization? is yeah. going to have all of those pieces are going to influence all the others. Sorry. Yeah. And and that's a topic we could probably do for another round table in the future, story and design combining. Um, I want to go to a question and check because it is an interesting one. Uh, Tokwa asks, how would you build a portfolio, portfolio around game design, especially if you are a solo developer? I get questions like that a lot. I, I generally uh, tell people, who, especially who want to get into other studios and showcase their work, um, to not focus so much. It's tough. If you want to make a game that you that you want to sell and that you want to get other people excited about, then yeah, totally focus on that game. If you want to make a reel or, or a website that kind of showcases your skills, focus on a lot of little games. Focus on a lot of different types of problems you're solving. Showcase your range. Um, and most importantly, showcase videos. Uh, showcase uh, an executable they can download and try it out. Um, but that's it's it, it's it's not something where you want to showcase a design document. <laughs> it's it, it's a game, not 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 just paper. Yeah. Um, so you want people to see it, uh, see the experience. You want some people to play the experience. Most importantly, uh, in order to to see what your skills are as a game designer. Certainly, in this day and age, uh, people are used to seeing videos with people talking over them. So you should show your work and then describe how it works and what's important about it. Um, and it, executables are a good idea, but in my experience, nobody plays them. So, but everybody will watch a video. So, certainly, if I had a, if I was looking around for a game design position now, there would be a lot of videos for different things. Where I would, uh, I would say, here's the first person shooter I worked on, and here's the mechanics that I personally developed. I would show them. I would explain them like a, a how-to video, sort of, so people can understand that you get it. You understand what the story is. People don't have a lot of time these days, so they're yeah. not they're not going to read stuff and they're not going to play stuff. They're just gonna they're gonna look at stuff on their phone and. I would it say it depends how far you get. Like if you if 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 I if you're deep in the process of of getting hired, especially, uh, and and I see your videos, I'll most likely try and pick one or two up if it's easy and easily accessible. I've done that up before. Mm -hmm. Certainly, so I won't disagree with that. And uh, talk about a follow up with, uh, do. do uh, so short polish experience on video uh, is narration good or bad for these videos I think it's good um, I think what you one of the things you're going to want to prove to your the prospective hiring person uh, is your ability to be very effective in a social environment uh, you need to be communicating a whole lot I mean sometimes you know, people are looking for designers as just a pair of hands and you get the job, you do what you're told, it's fine. But generally speaking, designer needs to be kind of a social center of sorts because of the need to disseminate knowledge and get people on the same page. Okay. Do that. So uh, I want to go back to something that uh, Richard said a, minute, a few minutes ago, talking about knowing more about soft skills when it comes to game design. Because this is something that I think a lot of developers, especially like first time indie devs or kind of the hobbyists taking that step and trying to make a commercial game, often tend to slip up on. Because as we've said, game design hits a lot of different aspects when it comes to making a video game. So for the table here, when we say soft skills, what comes to your mind as something a designer needs to know or needs to improve on? I would never hire anybody unless they've been a dungeon master for Dungeons and Dragons, personally. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> I would say, yeah, if you had been a DM, you're already a game designer. 
And uh, at SCAD, we we have a class that they actually sit in and teach them how to design modules for D and D. And a lot of people nowadays, a lot of the younger people, have never played role playing games because they're they're mostly computer game players. But when you get people around a table and you get somebody who's a dungeon master, and they actually they have to describe how the mechanics work. And I mean, D and D was the great you know the great I think the great threshold between. Uh, where games really started to become something special um, because they broke down actions into mechanics. And then when you're showing somebody how to do this and you're going through it, not only are you, you showing that you can tell a story and you can keep people engaged, you're showing people you understand mechanics and balance and, and all the, I guess, soft skills that, you, that, you're, that you're talking about. Yeah, for me, uh, there's three that come to mind. Um, uh, the first and foremost is leadership. Uh, as as a game designer on a team, you're you're leading uh, the gameplay uh, experience. You're driving the features, um, not necessarily on the project management side, but in terms of, of ensuring inspiration. Uh, people, the reason they're in this industry is because they have passion for it. And too often, do I see designers saying, "This is the, no, we need to do it this way." And and maybe they can help you understand the idea, but you're not bought into it. They're not selling it. They're not getting you excited about it. Um, and uh, it really is going to take that passion in order to get that game experience across the finish line. Uh, so leadership's a big one. Uh, it's pitching and selling, um, as I kind of already mentioned, is extremely important. It's not just important that they understand the design, but that they believe in it. And belief a lot for design. Uh, to me, I try to focus on design from problem-solving perspective. Um, so they have to understand that the, the problem exists. They have to understand that the problem needs to be solved and that this is the optimal solution to solve that problem. Um, and that ensures belief. Um, and the third is just collaboration. Um, too often I see people uh, designing in a vacuum and then bring something to everyone else, but it's again, it's an entire team effort. Uh, so it's, it's important to always be looking for feedback, searching it out, um, searching out ideas as well. Again, we're not idea generators, so it's important to constantly be pulling ideas from the entire team, from other mediums, from games. Um, we're always just looking for ideas and trying to find the right ideas more than come up with ideas on our own. Um, so yeah, those are the big three, uh, leadership, collaboration, and selling and pitching. So I yeah, would I think say uh, the one of my ones would be uh, able to interpret feedback because you know whether it's from teams, from testers, or whatever, you need to be able to in take the feedback in a good way because accepting feedback is is a whole nother <laughs> task entirely, and you need to be able to take that feedback and then you need to be able to dissect it and, and get to the core issues, you know, because you you have to be basically a doctor in a lot of sense because, you know, patient comes in, he says his stomach hurts, you know, he thinks it could be, you know, you know, a severe, you know, illness to his stomach, but actually he just needs to go to the bathroom, you know, and you got to, <coughs> you know, dump out the the what he thinks it is and you've got to actually get to the core of the issue and find out what the actual issue is and then you need to go back to your game design document or whatever you're working on and figure out the way to implement that fix into your systems without breaking everything else and you you become a problem solver based off of the feedback that you get I can agree with that. Damn, I mean, it takes it 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 takes your whole life. You know, you're, you're gonna die, and you could still get better at accepting and analyzing <laughs> feedback. <laughs> better have a thick skin too. Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there. I think the soft skill, uh, kind of like synthesizing a lot of the things you guys have said, is just like our our basic ability to socialize has a lot. You know, kind of wraps a lot of um, interaction. Uh, capabilities into this being able to understand what people are where they're coming from uh, being able to speak to where they're coming from and not to what they're saying uh, working with people and understanding like their limits like this whole thing is it's it's very people focused right because the products for people it, it's <laughs> kind of like if you can't explain a thing then how could you possibly expect yourself to build something that'll work for them yeah, and uh, I want to point out uh, Rat's Tales comes, and that's another really, really good one. There's a difference between working in a team and leading a team, and that is 100% true. And it is tough for a lot of developers, especially those starting out on the independent space. You know, when it's just themselves and maybe you know a few freelance or friends working on the game, 
versus sitting down and saying, okay, we have you know, a, t a five to ten person team, we have you know two to three years to build this project, how are we going to get this whole thing done and not go over budget? Yeah, that's a that's a huge task of scope and everything, and you have to really evaluate that at the at the start of the project. Mm -hmm. Yep. And like I said, Jack, do you have any other uh, soft skills to mention? Uh, I these guys covered it pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Richard did a great job, really breaking it down. <laughs> Green. So. When, and also for the chat, if for those of you new coming in, again, if you have any questions for us about this topic, let us know in the chat and we will get to them as they come in. But one thing that I want to ask you guys, going back to kind of the overall topic of teaching design, and part of that I think comes down to being able to study video games. And this is something that I know we've had minor discussions about on these roundtables. Shark and I have talked about this a lot on our Sunday shows. But it's an idea of being able to look at a video game beyond the consumer point of view. It's something that we've said before that you can play video games for all your life and you still don't get it. Like for myself, I didn't really start doing this until about 2012, 2013 and kind of grew from there. So my question for the table is, if you were to, again, going back to trying to teach this to someone, how would you tell somebody to study a video game, not just play it, but be able to understand it. Well, so Josh, I'm going to have to leave soon. Okay. Um, I can answer this. I'll spend four minutes answering this question, or probably less, and and then I'll have to run. Okay. Um, but uh, I think the most important starting point, by the way, is that is to recommend that someone play and browse or experience their entertainment with trying to understand what the voice of the author is. I think this is true of any medium and when you shift your your browsing of entertainment from what I like and what makes me feel good and makes me happy to what is it that the person who made this is trying to do. Uh, at first it's, you're going to be somewhat blind to it, you're going to make assumptions, you're going to think your experience will be what it is they're trying to do um, but with time you can separate those two things and you can start homing in on your understanding of and drawing a circle around what the agenda of the creators of this thing um, are and you'll get you'll get it wrong a lot uh, but it's the it's the it's the traje it's the it's the path of continuing to try and eventually you start getting pretty good at it because all of us creators are heavily influenced by all the other creators of, of entertainment and so you start to see the way uh, people's decisions to make a thing translate into audiences' tendencies to respond to a thing, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that's that's a it's, it's kind of like gathering feedback. It's a lifelong trajectory of sorts, um, but I think that's the core path to follow, at least from an analysis standpoint. Yeah. And, and um, I, I'll jump out in two minutes, uh, but I want to stick around to hear what anyone else says. Mm -hmm. Uh, when, well, when I, I started my job as a game professor at SCAD, uh, I actually had to learn to be a game professor because I, I'd had 20 years in the industry, but being an, a game academic is something different than being a professional developer. Uh, we, we teach stuff like where the concept of play comes from, like Homo Luddens and, and uh, the books like that, and rules of play that are that are more academic studies. So you actually can read those, and you. I saw someone posted about uh, MDA framework. Uh, a lot of wisdom has come from uh, GDC, where people will publish a paper or people will do a talk, and that will kind of become uh, a criteria that you learn from, is how, how you use aesthetics to design a game and how you use dynamics and mechanics and uh, doing stuff like using the Cerny method to design a game. And this is all stuff that's growing out of the industry, but we as teachers have to take it. And the difference the difference in teaching it and, and learning it as, and doing it as a profession is you have to teach game design as if they've never played a game. 
Whereas when they're they're building games, they typically they come in and they have they've played a million games. But when you're teaching it, you have to say, okay, this person doesn't understand anything about gaming, and you almost have to start from scratch and explain that and 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 get everybody on a common road, not just people who play shooters or JRPGs or or uh, things like that. They have to understand all genre. They have to understand that all genres are part of games and. You know, you can study individual genres, but you have to understand like the core, the core makeup behind what makes a game and what makes a game fun. And a lot of good stuff from uh, Greg Kostikian. You know, I, I I learned a lot of stuff from him. And uh, you really just you're taking what people have taught in the past and you're bringing it in, into combining it with teaching them how to recognize the certain aspects of game and what makes games different from other medium. Mm-hmm. All right, guys, I have to go. Uh, and I can say I definitely like uh, Greg's book, uh, Uncertainty in Games. It's a good title, too. <laughs> I think you could write great. 10 books about that. Yeah, Greg's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All, All right, right, Josh, thanks for having me. Uh, and it was very good to hang out and hear what everyone has to say. Uh, it's a pretty, it's an awesome roundtable today. And um, I'll, I can't wait to talk to you guys more in the future. Okay. And I will talk to you guys later. Yep, talk to, talk to Tom later, later, in a few weeks. See you later. All right, let's see how bad the windows get. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> All right, I will try and do my damnness to fix it as quickly as possible. But while I am going to do that, I'm going to do my best to multitask and bring up a point at the same time, which will probably fail completely, but we'll see. How, how about I take my point while we're waiting for you to set it up? Yep, go for it, and I'll do mine after that. All right. So... My answer to that would be a, you know, probably not the right way, but it's 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 a fun way kind of thing, and you know, making games is fun, so you know, <laughs> you should I I think you should have fun while you're making games. So, you know, one way to get into to analysis of games is just play games, and in the process, what you do is you analyze each mechanic in a way to basically min-max yourself, your character, to the highest level. And you, you, through doing that, you understand the systems bit by bit, more by more, as you keep on going through. And as you progress and you, you eventually learn all the systems that are in that game that you can visually see anyway. And hopefully, you know, you can learn some that you can't visually see. You can never get all of it, but you can certainly get a good whole of it. And if you do that on not necessarily every game that you play, but on a lot of games you play, you will get, you will figure out a lot of the, the mechanics and the way they work, the way the systems work. And, you know, you might be able to start figuring out how the systems work together, how they mesh together, how the gears fit together when they rotate. And from that, you will get, you will start to get an understanding of how to, you know, how the game design of that particular game works. And that will give you knowledge to go forward when you start designing your own games. I'll bounce off that 100%. Uh, Shark and Tomo, I'll, I'll, I'll merge those two answers. Um, 100% when you play games, you should be looking uh, more at the mechanics, the systems, how it all works, how it's all balanced. And and most importantly for me is uh, to not look at it as in what you like and don't like about it. Um, generally, uh, that leads to you making games that you will be the only person that likes. <laughs> um, it should be more about what their market uh, appreciates about it. It should be more about uh, what maybe their goals were when they made it, that you can try and start to understand why the system is this, why does this mechanic work this way? Oh, because they needed this to work this way so this other thing could fit into here, and that's how this all works. Um, the more you are able to break that stuff down and analyze it, the better you'll get. Um, and in terms of, it's, it's funny because in terms of uh, getting my designers uh, to get better at their skills of systems and mechanics design, um, I usually tell them to play Magic the Gathering, and I think it's something we all grew up playing. <laughs> um, it's it really your deck, 
and, and it's all about deck building. I have a designer who just download or, or downloads the list of cards that is in the champion deck right now. Do not do that. <laughs> that does not help you become a game designer. Build your own decks out of random cards if you have to. But really understand uh, what makes each of that, those decks work. Really understand the systems inside of it. Every card is one mechanic or multiple mechanics sometimes in a card. But the more you lose, the more you start to study and learn why you lost, why this mm -hmm. failed. Let me replace this. Let me, and it really is the like a one deck is the gameplay experience. Um, so th really, that's going to teach you and help you a lot more. It's it's really those failures that help you uh, learn the most. Yeah, I totally concur with that, and I think that brings up a good point that it's it's better to look at tabletop games as a good way to learn games rather than just digital games. <laughs> Certainly, Magic is 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 an amazing uh, has amazing mechanics, and it continually grows as we said before, Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, but I learned a lot playing Hero Clicks. I don't know if anybody mm. has ever seen Hero Clicks. That that is basically such. I mean, it's by Jordan Weisman who made the original Mech Warrior and Hero Clicks. It's it's all built around game mechanics and and different ways game mechanics can be uh, translated into uh, a superhero fighting game. So I, I use that a lot when I'm teaching to demonstrate really cool mechanics. I use Magic too. And Dungeons mm -hmm. Dragons, of course. So, um, and we teach a lot of board game design at SCAD because um, I don't think a lot of people. I think when they have, they're forced to do board game design, they take the sort of the sexiness out of video games, <laughs> which is beautiful graphics and sound and everything like that. That in a way can hide game mechanics, and it really strips it bare for you to look at and understand. This is an original mechanic w that nobody else is doing, right? Mm -hmm. I mean. People, if, if everybody made Candyland, you know, or Candyland clone, which is roll dice and go around a board, you know, that's like everybody making the exact same shooter, right? <laughs> There's nothing new there. And, you know, you've got to look at, at new games like Settlers of Catan or Twilight Imperium or things like that that actually are introducing new types of mechanics and new types of gameplay. And that that I think that's a really effective way is, is, is learning tabletop. Yeah. And yeah, I completely agree because, like, I, you know, especially with the whole magic and D&D &D conversation, because, like, that's that's basically how I started off in game design is, is you know, I was a writer first, and then, and then um, you know, and I was always playing D&D &D and magic and Yu-Gi-Oh! and all kinds of other card games with my friends and everything, and, you know, came up a situation where we you know where we wanted to play a game around a certain anime there wasn't a game like that that existed so I wrote my own you know and and it was horribly bugged and glitchy and everything and I learned a lot of lessons from that and then and then there was another instance that came up I wrote another and another and another and another until I finally you know got a few that were really solid kind of thing and you know that that was really where I and then I took that and translated that into game design whenever I started working on that mm -hmm. yeah and um, I think both uh, I think all three made really good points about tabletop design and it is something that I think I think Jack said that a lot of people look at it as you know the unsexy part of game design is the lesser of making a video game. But to, truth be told, you are working with just pure mechanics. You don't have aesthetics, you don't have art or sound to kind of hide or distract from bad design. And I, as somebody who... I did not grow up playing tabletop games at all. I didn't really start playing them till or play them a little bit until maybe about two, three years ago when a few friends got me into Tabletop Simulator. And they were showing me these games with, like, persistent elements and just, like, these insane rules. I'm like, wait, this is a tabletop game today? I, all I've been doing was playing Monopoly and, and uh, Sorry back in my day. Yeah. And it is you gotta, very you gotta amazing. Play Euro, you gotta play those Euro games. Yeah. Those are, those are crazy. And uh, to go back to my point, um, thanks to everyone for kind of distracting the chat while I mess around with all the windows. <laughs> but the point that I wanted to kind of build off from what Tomo was saying earlier, that, I, that you guys also said as well, is being able to understand the intent of the designer. And I think that really drives home kind of one of those major lines between somebody who is just a gamer and somebody who understands design. 
Because I've, well, a lot of the stuff I do with researching other YouTubers and streamers to see how they handle things, the thing that I always hear from a lot of people who don't understand design is, you know, the developer is stupid. Why did I die here? You know, they just did something lazy or, you know, it's not my fault I died. It's the game being dumb. And there is very little understanding of, you know, why was this put into the game? What was the goal of having this element in there? And it's one of the things, when I wrote a piece earlier this year about kind of reviewing games, I said that originally I thought it was just about pure mechanics, because again, that's where I come from. But I've come to realize that it really is about understanding what was the goal the developer wanted to achieve, and did they do that? If somebody wanted to make a story-driven game, and let's say the platforming is a little rough, but the story comes through amazingly, I would say they succeeded. If they wanted to make a brutally difficult first-person shooter, and let's say the story is a little hokey and it's a little cliche, but the mechanics are right, I would say that they succeeded as well. So, yeah, 100% from my perspective in terms of uh, goals, uh, generally we try to push more goal-driven design. It's a very subjective field, mm -hmm. and um, when you're working with a team, it's like anyone's ideas, yeah, like they, a lot of them could work, what do we go with? And and that's where you really need to be uh, more goal-driven, whether your goal might be to push more players to a crafting system or or to make sure players respawn closer to their to their home base. Um, there, there's there's a lot of goals that you could have, but they're all generally experiential goals. Like, what are you trying to accomplish with this mechanic, with this feature? Um, what's the problem that's that's currently occurring that needs to be solved? And and generally, when people can line up on the goals, it makes it a lot easier to 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 talk then about the actual solution. Right, and people get to that. You get game designers get to that solution by the. I, I think one of the key things game designers are. They're problem solvers. You know, they 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 find a problem and then they find they they make a solution for that problem and issue it out through the game design document. Mm -hmm. And that kind of problem solving again is just a major part of iterating on design. And this is something that I'm sure each one of you have thought about many times over, and if Tomo was still here, he would probably say as well, that challenge of getting outside your head. I think Richard said this earlier about being able to look outside and taking in that feedback. Because as anybody knows, you know, the game is perfect in your head, you know, how can it be wrong? You know, surely it's the consumer who's not playing the game right. But it takes a lot for somebody to kind of be able to stand back and say, okay, maybe my idea didn't work. Maybe this isn't the correct way of doing it. And again, like we said earlier, like social skills, being able to take this feedback is so essential as a soft skill for a designer. Yeah, but, you know, sometimes the player isn't playing the game right. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 the thing is, is they're not playing the game right because you didn't teach them how to play the game right. You didn't, mm -hmm. you know... Like, there was a point where, um, one point in my game, where, my last game, where, you know, it was a, you know, big boss, it is supposed to kill you, you're supposed to die, and I didn't want to force it, kind of thing, but I wanted it to be, you know, you're, you're not going to have any way to prepare for it unless you know for it in advance, and then you die, and then you go to New Game Plus, and you start back over, kind of thing, but with all your stats and everything, but, like, People were were you know quitting mid game mid match, and then going back and grinding, and you know I solved that problem by you know if they quit the match it counts as a forfeit they lose and then it goes into new game plus. You know there was another point where you know same exact spot in the game where they would lose a battle, and then they would and then right as it's playing the cutscene and everything giving them the ending. They would just close, they would, uh, I forget what they did. Uh, they would, it would give them a chance to save or not. They would choose not to save. And then it would kick them back to the new game plus, And then they would close out the game. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, went to uh, like an auto save kind of thing. And made it to where when they went to the, uh, 
you know, made it clear that this was the path they were supposed to be going kind of thing. But at the same time, leaving the option for, like, people who are, like, really hardcore to be able to actually beat that boss. You know, if they know it's coming, they can go beat that boss and they can try a, you know, a deathless run, basically, kind of thing, if they wanted to. So I didn't want to remove that for players, but I didn't, I wanted, the, you know, the players to not get stuck in the grind that I didn't intend for them, except for the ones that wanted that. So, you know, you know, because they're playing it wrong doesn't mean it's their fault. It means you have an issue with your game design kind of thing. And, you know, you, you and not analyze those positions, figure out what you can do to fix it. And I issued so many fixes in that one location, it was crazy. There was like, I think like six or seven fixes I had to do because after I fixed one thing, somebody <laughs> does something else. And then somebody does something else. I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> this spot's yeah. a mess. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, game game players have evolved and not in a good way because if you look back in the 90s when I was playing games, you'd have games come out like Falcon 3.0 that you'd have to read a whole manual to play. <laughs> and oh, now nice. no one has patience to do anything like that. You've got to you've got to have I mean because of I, I blame Nintendo. You've got to have endless tutorials showing you how to do every little thing. And you have to have every game, kind of like every superhero story is always a re reboot of the origin. Now you've got to have every game treat a player like they've never played a game before. So a lot of the mm -hmm. time you're you're building a game that is really the first half of the game is just teaching them how to play it. Mm -hmm. And the back half is them trying to go crazy with it instead of like starting it where they actually know where uh, where something is. Mm -hmm. And again, like that's another area where I see a lot of indie developers tend to slip up on, that they'll go for a zero onboarding. And I played a game a few weeks ago where it was a platformer that no one looked, there was no control rebind, there was no option menus. I just had to guess what what the keys the developer wanted me to use to play this game. And it is tough to get that balance right because, as you just said, Jack, there are people who approach a game like they, as someone who's never played the game. So you design a tutorial around them, but then you'll have somebody who is that hard and expert, the one who's played every flight sim, space sim, first person shoot, whatever you want to say, and they're going to load up your game and say, press W to move forward. Why the hell am I doing that? Get fed up and, you know, just stop playing the game. And, you know, we've used that term before, you know, when the, the real game begins can mean different things for different people, and it can be a nightmare to kind of make sure everybody's on the same page. Yeah, and and I figure, I find that, you know, the tutorial design is a very important part of, of both the, the game designer and the UX designers, uh, you know, part in the role because like ideally the tutorial should be something that players don't even realize there's a tutorial you know seamless you know like don't hold their hands but teach them everything they know without them even realize that they're learning everything they need to know and do it in such a way that it's seamless you know like you know you can do it you know you can technically do it through writing you can you know put a little line in the the script that says hey you should probably you know do this kind of thing you know when it's you know banter between the two characters kind of thing or you could have it where you know a side of the screen is flashing or glowing kind of <laughs> thing to direct the player's eye over there or you can put it to where you know you you set the mouse you know the default position really close to an object and then they have no choice but to when they move that mouse they'll hover over it and it'll show that they hover over it mm -hmm. and I, I feel like that's really important part of a game designer's job you know but he has to work together with writers and UX designers in the process of that depending on how they go with the you know with the tutorial one of the strangest, like as a little brief tangent, I've been playing a lot more mobile heavy games in my spare time, gotchas and hero collectors and stuff like that, and those games do a very surprisingly good job 
of walking through the player, how they understand having like 18 different currencies and how all these characters upgrade and making it in a way that I think as to Shark's point that the tutorial or the onboarding is integrated into the general gameplay. What's the first what's the first thing a new player is going to do? Well, they're going to start stage 1-1. One -one. Okay, we'll walk them through that. And again, this gets back at the heart of this discussion that the problem though is that every game is different. It is very easy to design a dynamic or a um, organic tutorial in an action game. Now, how about do that for something like Total War or Stellaris, where it's a game that just hits you with systems. And again, if we had an easy solution, I think someone would be famous by now for how to design you know, the perfect tutorial for every game. I think a lot of it comes down to um, audience and expectations. Um, when you're on mobile, your goal is to be as mass market as possible, so your hope is that everyone can pick it up and play. When you're playing more top-down, deep strategy games, uh, and of course many, many sequels in, you know generally who your exact audience mm -hmm. is, you know how many people have come from the previous one, um, so you, you have a better idea of what to teach, not only what to teach, but, but who to test. And I think that's a lot of the the issues that we're, we're talking about in terms of over tutorializing or, or things like that is because the people we play test aren't necessarily the audience and so they have different expectations they have different knowledge going into it and maybe now we're trying to uh, serve them uh, even though they may not be the perfect end consumer um, so I think some of the best games out there uh, maybe mobile games in general things like that will they launch really soon and really early and, mm -hmm. and try and uh, get to their audience as soon as possible and grow the game with their audience. Um, so knowing your audience, knowing their expectations, and then building uh, all of your stuff towards that in terms of tutorials. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to just interject for a second. In terms of a time check, we've been going for about 50 or so minutes. Is everybody good? You have to kind of get going maybe like 15, 20 minutes. Like, how's everybody's time look right now? 15, I'm good for us tonight. 20. 15, 20 is good for me. Okay. Yep. Yeah. All right, so uh, let's say for like 9 p.m., so in like 20 minutes. So for the chat or for the cast here, or I'm sorry, for the audience, if you have any questions for us, uh, please get them in. I will give a final or a last call for questions in 10 minutes, and then we'll wrap things up 10 minutes after that. So uh, for getting back on the topic, one thing that I want to ask everyone, I was hoping... And maybe if Tomo is still watching, maybe he's watching this in the future, maybe he can leave a comment for his answer. But He's, he's chatting, so he's watching. <laughs> I think he just loved just to force me to adjust the windows in real time. Mm -hmm. He just uh, wanted to test me live. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my question for the room here has to do with things that you don't want to see. or Are there any red flags or things like, as maybe like a student or a first-time designer? that when you're trying to teach them game design, that you want to try and break them out of any habits or things that they try and do. Don't try to shoe in all the genres. Don't, don't, don't think that adding more genres is going to make a design better. You need to design around a specific situation and as for a specific game. And most of the time, I, I think that unless you're an advanced designer, the, the best, and even if you are the best designer, like uh, a lot of times, a sticking to a single genre is a very solid way to, to design a game. You know, but, you know, there, there, there are ways to, you know, bring in mechanics and systems from other games kind of thing if they fit that particular design. But, you would that was more advanced kind of thing and but you know just don't start off with putting all kinds of genres in there start off with single genre games and then work on that genre and how to make it different original and fit your particular design i guess you would say how to make the design fit the design that, that doesn't really make any sense but um it needs to fit the overall goal of what you're shooting for. So if you're shooting for a platformer, but you want to have a feel for like horror, then you need to implement mechanics in there to, to make you feel that the, the horror vibes, you know, anticipation, you know, um, 
fear and all that stuff, anxiety. You need to, you know, like, you know, I, I know like the sonic timer in, in, in the water worlds are very good at inducing anxiety. So, you know, they're, they're halfway to a horror game right there. <laughs> Just a solid underwater sonic level game. Right. That would be a true horror. Right, uh, Richard or Jack? I was going to let Richard talk because I've been saying too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess from my perspective, uh, one of the big things I try to uh, break out of early junior designers is uh, it's, it's 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 weird to say, but it's it's to break the expectation that they own the design. Um, doing the, them them owning the design generally leads to them designing in a vacuum or thinking that their ideas are what's going in. Uh, to me, design, game design, being a game designer, excuse me, is about owning the vision and driving the gameplay experience. Owning the vision means understanding how everything's supposed to come together. How, what's, what's your goals? How does that connect to the overall director's vision? How does that connect to all the other designers around you, this, their vision of their systems, how that's going to work? Because that vision comes well before the game is actually built, generally. Um, but you know the experience you're going for, you're trying to reach as you're building this out. So it's, it's, it's you who owns the vision, and the goal is to empower the team to sort of own the game. Um, with that type of mentality, you're, you, you end up uh, building the passion in the team and, and driving them to, to push and push and push for a great experience, rather than designers designing in a vacuum saying, oh, I own this, this is mine, <laughs> here, do this, and start dictating design. Um, it's about more ownership of the vision. That's great. Uh, yeah. Personally, uh, what I try to find is I encourage people to have original ideas and to think outside the box, and I don't like it when they just want to remake a game that they that's already exists out there or they've already you know like they want to make Skyrim or they want to mm -hmm. make Call of Duty for me that that's not going to help them as a game designer because I think that's not an exciting thing is to redo something that somebody else has already done I think it's important that they come up with fresh ideas that have never or fresh angles that haven't been tackled before so I really discourage uh, just remaking the same old thing again. That's I definitely, especially in my applied game design class, um, originality is one of the the rubrics that they're they're uh, they're graded on because if they just you know if they're just going to come make Witcher three, <laughs> I don't need that right. They don't need that because it's already done. And it's done a million times better than they're due. But if, you know if they come out and they make Fall Guys or they make Kerbal Space Program or you know, Katamari Dynasty, that's how they're going to break through and they're going to become <laughs> a great designer. Yep, and yeah, I, I think that if, if, if they're just remaking a game, I think that would be fine for like a programmer or something else like that just to learn and get the skills. But for a designer, no. Like designer, you know, copying somebody else's design <laughs> isn't being a designer. That's just, you know, that's like saying that you took a test and you just copied off of somebody else. Yeah, I mean, uh, for Shark and I, like, we look at indie games every week. We look at whatever's coming out as well as on our Sunday show. And how many games have we seen that looked like just somebody else's game, but being done by them? And a lot. Yeah, and yeah. To, mo my God, mobile games—they're all oh, that yes. same, that same like fake tycoon fake SimCity mm -hmm. thing where you're building stuff and waiting on stuff and you know they've got these ads that you look at and they're amazing and like oh my god that looks like such yeah. a cool game and as soon as you get in it's like okay build the field and now you have to wait right and it's like my god if I see one more of those games <laughs> I'm just not, I'm going to lose it Yeah, and uh, to what Jack said about how you know you could make The Witcher it is possible that somebody could make that game but why? Why should I play your version of The Witcher when C Project Red has their really great version. And yeah, it's one of the things I see, like when I did my research for platformers for my second book, I played a lot of indie platformers. And a majority of them just simply copied, you know, a Mario or a Mega Man. And in many cases, they were worse than the games they were trying to emulate. And the ones that saw to me were the ones that did something differently. You know, something like uh, Celeste, or the End series, or um, Bray, or anything along those lines that were like, yes, it's a platformer, but I am doing X differently. 
And it's figuring out what that X is, that in a lot of cases is what can make or break a title. And I also want to definitely uh, agree with Richard about the fact that you don't own it. You don't own that idea as the creative director, lead designer, whatever your title is going to be. Because we've heard those stories about, you know, the rock star developer, the one who, you know, if they're not part of this project, it will fail and sink. So we have to put up with whatever crazy things they want to do. And, like, somebody posted on Twitter, like, a week or so about some, like, crazy designer for a game that failed who he left to go on mountain retreats for, like, three to four months at a time. They never told the publisher Sure. So he would just like disappear to like the very morning that the publisher wanted to see the game. He said like two things and then he left for another three to four months and nobody could do anything because he was the lead of the studio. Okay. Uh, Chris, Chris brought up a point about uh, uh, how Concerned Ape started off with making a Harvest Moon like at first. I'm, I'm unsure if that's true, but let's just assume that it is the point of this conversation um the the reason you know like normally stardew valley would have completely failed because it was you know just taking harvest moon and and translating it you know basically but then he he took it you know several steps farther in the design he he um and he released it on PC, which was there was absolutely no games like that on 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 PC. And plus, he had an amazing aesthetic to it, so he was able to succeed. But like, we don't need to be using you know Stardew Valley as a you know example kind of thing because it's more of an exception kind of thing to the rule. And there's always exceptions to rules, but you know. Stardew Valley and in Untitled Goose Game and like several other games are like really exceptions mm -hmm. to the rule to becoming successful games, and we don't need to to you know and same thing with Fortnite you know <laughs> because like like PUBG was first and PUBG you know and Fortnite just well, Armed Assault was Armed yeah. Assault mod was first <laughs> yeah Arma <laughs> was well, the same developer yeah but like. The you know, PUBG was the first game so solely around that aspect of the battle royale, and then I, I think I think from my perspective, and this is I think what you're kind of saying. Um, I mean, for for me, we call them differentiators, right? How you differentiate your title. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I think a big thing, and I know we're here to talk about game design, is that aesthetic can be a differentiator, and I think that's yeah. where some of these games like Fortnite. Uh, aesthetically, oh, yes. completely differentiated the experience and brought it to a, a much a broader audience. Um, of course, with building as well inside of it, uh, being a differentiator for that experience, uh, which which the earlier ones didn't have in terms of quick, fast building right in front of you. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think we shouldn't. Uh, and, and you mentioned the shark as well. That that Stardew Valley had a great aesthetic to it. Um, so it, that 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 can be extremely powerful, obviously. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Oh yes. And the way the way I look at it. Um, if you're not pushing yourself as a designer, if you if you compare us to something like uh, painters or artists, I mean, Picasso could paint perfectly. He could he could pay, he could replicate any master as good as the master, as good as Rembrandt or anybody else. But as he became more accomplished, he created his own style, mm -hmm. and and then he became, you know, he went beyond just being a great artist to becoming one of the best artists ever. So for, for my designers, I'm always, yes, understand understand what's out there and, under, and start and, and use that as a starting block. But mm -hmm. you've got to you've got to bring something new to the table if you want to if you want to stand out. Um, it's really hard now to get a job just as a game designer in the industry mm -hmm. um, to be hired. I mean, you, I mean, from where I'm sitting, it's easier to get hired as a level designer, a systems designer than as a game designer who is just coming in there and they're mm -hmm. basically writing game design documents because they, they're they going to want to see something new and exciting that they've never seen before. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have to show them something. You're going to have to show them you can create a new mechanic or you can create a new aesthetic or you're developing new, new dynamics, whether, whether through pre-thought and writing a design document about it or being able to prototype 
and taking something and iterating until you have something fun. I think you've got to you've got to show them something that's that's that hasn't been done before in a, in a certain way. I mean, Battle Royale that was mm-hmm. to me a, almost a completely original uh, game, and it really could not have been created until you could spawn in a hundred players on a forty mm-hmm. you know forty by forty server. So realistically, technically, you couldn't do it before they did it, and I think that that's what made it special and then you know now everybody of course is doing it to where it's it's the dead horse of our day uh <laughs> yeah. but um you know i i think learn everything learn all the mechanics learn what everybody else is doing and then try your best to strike out on your zone and and blaze a new trail um mm-hmm. that, that definitely what i what i try to teach yeah, yeah. blazing a trail is going your own way is definitely the key to to game design because if your game isn't different, then mm-hmm. why should they buy your game over the other game? Yeah. I mean, uh, if you could look at something like Disco Elysium as a really good example, that Disco Elysium, at its most basic core, is just like a twine game. It's a simple choose your own adventure. You know, click the text, you get a description, click another text, it's done. But what they did was they elevated that to such an extreme with their aesthetics. And just with what they challenged the player could do in that space, that a lot of people are just like left scratching their heads as to, you know, where the hell did this game come from? And mm-hmm. the same thing with kind of like the people who completely miss Battle Royale, who never heard of, heard of PUBG or H1Z1 or the Arma mod. And then all of a sudden, Epic says, we're going to turn this our survival building game into a Battle Royale. And everyone's like, Ew, you know, that's never going to work. What the hell are you doing? And now Fortnite is, again, it be like to Jack's point about Picasso, like they became the standard that now everybody else is being judged due to their mastery of that specific design. Well, only because it makes money. I yeah. think if it wasn't a money maker, <laughs> yes. people, people wouldn't pay any attention to it because it's not, I mean, from my standpoint, it's not. It's not a fun game. It's not particularly an impressive game, art-wise or design-wise. Uh, you know, I'm probably alone on my little mountain saying that. But that's going to be know, a when, next... it, when I played it. When I played it, I was bored. I can play PUBG all day long, but I mean Fortnite. <laughs> I was bored in 15 seconds. You know, that's... and I gave it. I gave it a long time, but I was like, I was just like, I just do not <laughs> like this aesthetic. That's yeah, going to be I, I next month's topic. There we go. There's next one's topic. Why Fortnite is horrible. There we go. We we got it. We got the clickbait and the discussion all in the same right there. <laughs> and uh, time check is about 8.52, so about another like five or so minutes. So for the chat, this will be officially last call for questions. Because we'll be wrapping we this up. Have one. They're all answering their own questions in the chat. They're pretty. You, you should get these guys to be in the next. There, <laughs> the next it's chat. great. I, I do such it's a, a good really good, some really amazing stuff. It's perfect. They they ask their own questions. They answer them. I'm not them. mad at Fortnite. <laughs> and I can just do. I just have to sit back here. This is perfect. Like why should I even do stream shark? I just just let the chat go. I just go get a sandwich and I'll, <laughs> and that's it. That's it. <laughs> but we did have a question for Kassan Wright though. Yeah. You want to go ahead and get to that Let's one? Let's see if I can get it here. Not Fortnite. I, I'm seeing Fortnite is only horrible if you're bad at it. I can play <laughs> the heck. I can play the heck out of Fortnite and Apex Legends, but it still doesn't mean I like it. Oh, here it is. Um, uh, Kassan asked, "What do you think is a good sequence slash order of topics to teach? How do you verify what you have taught has been well assimilated?" I'll let Richard go. <laughs> oh, that's a tough one. Um, I mean, it's interesting. Some things came up in this conversation already. Um, to me, the first basic knowledge of game design comes from your library of understanding of the industry. Uh, so we talked already about playing games and how to actually analyze games, not just play them for yourself. Uh, so that's sort of step one for me. Uh, step two is is them under better understanding uh, mechanics and systems. Uh, again, there's a lot of different areas to go to for that, but uh, I, I talked about Magic the Gathering, and, and, and it's a lot of that's really just trial and error and, and, and getting in and, and try to create. Um, and overall, with, with a lot of that stuff, if, if it's working well, then, then they're succeeding at what they create. Um, uh, when I go to soft skills, uh, pitching and selling, it, it's, it's really just to, 
to get them to, to pitch me and then I, I critique and then I tell them no I don't I don't understand what you're saying I don't understand your idea here this where did this come from this hasn't had anything to do with this goal and we break it down step by step to, to make sure that 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 what they're saying is cohesive sort of so it's almost pitching uh, a design will help you understand the components of it even better sort of like teaching helps you understand the subject and uh, and with that we can try and get deeper and deeper into uh, the mechanics and, and understanding of why this design is successful, why it isn't. Uh, that's awesome stuff. Uh, the way I teach design is, um, well, I have, I have m many classes that I teach design. I have a core principles of game design class. And what we do is we really break it down to, we look at a little bit of history and see, you know, look at study genres and, and what's out there. Uh, study mechanics, study the, the creators of the genres and kind of what they did and what's great and then slowly start getting them into board game design by doing a paper prototype which is a really simple paper prototype then move to a piece pack system where they have uh, predetermined game pieces and they have to create an original rule set and then finally um, in core principles we do a full on board game and the Euro style of board games, which is a really strong aesthetic board game with amazing art, and they have to do the whole thing where they've got to do the art, they've got to even make the box and everything like that. So they 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 actually learn everything, and they 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 experience everything as the designer, except for the technical parts of it. So you really you can have everybody participating in building it because they don't necessarily have to be a scripter or a 3D animator or a 3D modeler to build it. Um, in my applied game design class, which is an upper level game design class, we we look at Mark Cerny and how he kind of starts with the three C's, character, camera, and control, and you develop a character based on that first, and you make a toy first, and then without respect to the rest of the game, you make a fun toy that gives you a strong moment-to-moment -moment experience, and then you build a game around that whole toy. So, um, I mean, that, that's the approaches I take and, you know, where I am. Well, mine, mine's a completely different as, uh, perspective, rather, because, like, I don't teach people the same way you guys do. You know, main re way I teach people is through, you know, YouTube, answering questions and whatnot and doing these podcasts with Josh every week and, uh, you know, the roundtable once a month. And, uh, you know, then also like any game developer that, you know, I talk to on any Discord or whatever, they have questions and I try to, you know, give them the best educated answer I have. And, you know, you know, on a one-on-one -on -one basis kind of thing. And, you know, it, it's really different from what you guys do. <laughs> That's a good way though. I mean, you know, because you're, you're, you're the you're the mentor, you're the sage in the room, and you're kind of setting them straight, and you're giving them something to bounce off of, because otherwise they're just coming to their own conclusions. And when you're just hanging around with them, if you've been if you've got a lot of experience building games, you've already hit a lot of the pitfalls that they're going to hit, and you can hopefully help them avoid it. So it's you know that that's a great learning experience too. I, I have a I have a lot of failure. I have a lot of experience of failure, and and as they Me say, too. you you, yeah. you learn more from failure yes. than you do from from success. And I have had I don't know about fifteen years worth of failure, so <laughs> solid failure. So I have I have I have a lot of stuff I've learned over the years. All right. Um, we are knocking on time. So two questions came in. I want to get to them. And then I have one final question to end the cast on for everyone. So the first one from Chris asks, do you guys have any game design exercises that you take part in? So something, I guess, to do to kind of, like, I guess, improve your own look at game design or something you do just to kind of, like, keep your skills sharp or fresh. Well, I just play games, and <laughs> when I play games, I can't shut my mind off, and I'm sitting Me there either. dissecting all the mechanics and everything, or I watch Josh play games, and I'm sitting here dissecting all the mechanics and everything as he's playing. I just, you know, like, it, it's like once my once I flipped my switch many years ago, I, I haven't been able to turn it off. So, like, just playing a game just, you know, like gets me to dissect the design of the games I'm playing. So, you know, get it 
they're almost osmosis in a way. <laughs> I mean, for me, I, I love paper prototypes. Um, I know Jack said that a lot. Um, and, and more recently, I've begun to create board games for sort of family holiday moments. So when you go back to visit the family, I have like a, a, a simple prototype of something. And uh, I'll tell you, the hardest thing is to get feedback from family. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so yeah. So if, you, if you're good at that, then, then you can get feedback from anybody. Uh, but then we end up start riffing on it, building something better. And by the end of, of the weekend or however long the holiday was, um, we have something really interesting at the end. So it's, it's, it's the paper prototypes I'm a huge advocate for. And, and, and also recently I've tried to take my favorite moments in video games and turn them into a paper prototype. For example, uh, Final Fantasy VI was one of my favorites, and there's a moment called the Battle of Narsh. You can look it up. And I was like, okay, what if I turn that moment in that <laughs> game into a board game and try that out? And that, that'll help you really uh, break down mechanics and systems and break down what was intriguing and fun about that experience for you and, and try, to, try to really instill that into something more simple like a board game. You are definitely a game designer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, one uh, uh, just to to name an exercise, we we have a ton of them, but uh, I think one of them and it harkens back to something Richard was saying about collaboration is a, is an exercise called the exquisite corpse, where somebody designs something and they pass it to the next guy, and then they design something, and it keeps going around, and it basically it evolves to become something else. It's a it's a pretty cool exercise for for new people to try. So I think that's a, that's one of the ones I use. That's an interesting one. <laughs> okay. You can look it up on Wikipedia. Nice. It's kind of weird. I think <laughs> artists do it, too. Uh, let's <laughs> see. And then this is the last question from chat, and then I'll get to my final question for the room. Uh, Rat asked, or Rat Sale asked, uh, how do you find a direction when you don't have one, when you are building a game for the first time? Blank page. <laughs> Uh, I've done this a lot. I've been I've been in a position where I had to do a lot of blank page games. Uh, it's it's really difficult uh, to come up with something. I mean, we when I was at Crytek, we had to we had to pitch a game to EA, and uh, you know they we had done Far Cry, and then they wanted a they wanted a shooter that we were going to make that was a follow it was like a spiritual successor. To Far Cry, but we knew we couldn't do Far Cry. So for me, I, I just start combining things. And um, uh, my boss, Chevot Yearly, came. He had the the concept artist come in with a picture of a tropical island, and it was like frozen, but you could still see all the colors and everything. So obviously, it was like Flash Frozen. And we basically built Crytek from that picture. And we we said, okay, who would freeze stuff like that? Okay, aliens. Uh, why would they freeze that? Because they're terraforming, and it, it grew out of that. And so, um, you know, it can come from a number of ideas, but certainly um, it can be a picture, it can be a story you've read, uh, you know, and you're, you're, bring, you're, you know, you're, you're looking at something, you know, you've read, you've read 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, or you read Dr you know, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and things like that, and, and just find a way to make the, a game out of that, you know. But it, it's tough. When a blank page is tough to start with and come up with something cool. Yep. For myself, I have a rather different approach. You know, I, you know, I'm just, you know, I would think about it and kind of think about where, you know, kind of the general areas that we need to go. Like maybe a, you know, like a certain section of genres or something along that lines. And I would just ponder on it and I would keep that in the back of my mind. And then I would go do something completely else. I would go play a game, watch, you know, something on the internet, you know, go to sleep. And it's often when I wake up from a dream or, you know, when I go take a shower and my mind's just in a state to where it's just more creative kind of thing. Just all of a sudden, something will, pop, something crazy will pop into my mind, and it's like, yes, I like that. And then I just, while I'm on that train of thought, I just start piecing together. And you know, usually by the the you know, like five, ten, fifteen minutes later, by the end of the you know shower or whatever, you know, by the end of me waking up, kind of thing, I have probably a core gameplay loop 
ready to go kind of thing. And then and then I can take that and then I take that and go to my computer right away and just start typing it out, get it on paper and everything. And then I look at it on paper and then I start iterating and expanding upon that initial idea kind of thing into a, you know, a mini game design document, I guess you would call it, you know, something that's not encompassing at all, but, you know, something that just gets a lot of the basics out of the way. And then I go from there and see if I want to develop it farther. And I have, I don't know, 30 or 40 games like that on my computer right now, you know, back with backlogged for me to maybe eventually make when I go farther with them. And some of them, I have gone farther with the design and worked them out into maybe not a full game design document. There might, there's a few that probably are full game design documents, but like most of them, I just take to probably, I don't know, maybe half or quarter game design document, you know, probably about, I don't know, enough that you could scroll down a notepad file probably about 10, 15 times. And, you know, then, you know, I just, you know, if I was going to make that into full design, then I would grab that and continue developing on it. And anything uh, from you, Richard? Oh, sorry, I got my cat trying to get on the camera. <laughs> I, I, I got mine down here, too. I got mine, mine down here is, is hungry, so I've got to feed her. Right. <laughs> Cats um, yeah, I mean, for me, uh, there's sort of a, a real answer and a joke answer, I think. Uh, the, the real answer is is to really determine one goal. Determine one goal you have, um, whether it's to make the best co-op game or to just make um, something unique in a specific genre. And, and just immerse yourself then in that genre, in, in that style, in your references, um, and just try and figure out uh, through that immersion what you, what you can accomplish that could be different, that could help you in that experience. The joke answer is is it, it reminds me a bit of paper papers please um, which when you look at that game on paper it looks like why that doesn't look exciting that doesn't look <laughs> like it would be a challenging fun experience i don't understand and it, it's great it's an amazing experience mm -hmm. and so i would try to find something around you that is neither exciting nor challenging and make it so um, make a, a door game of just opening a door the most exciting and challenging experience out there um, and I think I think that's a true game design challenge that can that can lead you down really interesting routes. Yeah. And this is where Door Simulator got its inspiration from. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here's my final question, and then we will end our little discussion on bringing this back to this idea of teaching game design to a new generation and trying to get these thoughts or get this idea going as early as possible. And one thing that I saw that I really liked the trend of was Super Mario Maker. And while the Mario Maker community has certainly grown to, you know, create insane Kaizo levels, puzzle maps, things that would never fit into a real game, it still stands as a very effective tool to teach somebody who has never touched code, who doesn't understand engines or art or anything like that, a chance to just do pure game design in that front. So, my final question for the room is, do you like this idea of having almost, like, gameless games or just editor games as a form of teaching design to people I think it works for level design I don't think it would work for design design mm -hmm. unless there was a way to actually manipulate the mechanics of the game in such a way that would make it a completely different experience but I think it would be great for a level designer because they can figure out you know they can get their toes wet, so to speak, and and figure out the way to, you know, give, you know, experiences in the way that they think it is, you know, the appropriate way. Whether it's, you know, super hardcore like a Kaizo game, or whether it's, you know, intuitive and everything like like the first levels of Mario, and you know. You know, they can also explore all kinds of different things through level design in that, but as for game design, I mean, like, there's probably a little bit they can learn from that, but I, I wouldn't put that as a lead source for learning game design. All right. Yeah, if you're asking about just uh, those experiences out there where you get to create just deeper levels in, in the game itself, uh, 
Um, I agree in the sense that it is uh, pushing more for level design. It really depends on how deep the tools go for you to alter the experience and alter the challenge, alter the mechanics. Because um, modding tools in general are a great uh, opportunity for, for people to, to dive into them and, mm -hmm. and create new experiences, create new games and new opportunities. Um, so, I mean, in terms of where our industry is at nowadays, the opportunity is there to just mod uh, something. Back in my day, it was Neverwinter Nights was like the first <laughs> mod uh, modding tools I, I had and I, I tried to create things in. Um, so I would def generally, def oh, sorry, I would definitely push uh, people who want to be game designers in towards modding tools. Um, of course, towards Unity and Unreal because that's 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 just the rawest uh, uh, form that you can kind of create anything. Um, but yeah, it it really depends on how open the tools are for creation. Yeah, modding could be a good start for somebody. Hmm. Uh, I think it's cool. I mean, basically, uh, multiplayer map building so you you put out a map editor for somebody and they start building maps and they certainly are going to understand they're certainly going to start learning the dynamics of the of the mission and and how things work together and um they're going to learn what works and what doesn't work and it's pretty mm -hmm. easy in any engine just to pick up pick up things and move them around mm -hmm. it's not something you have to to learn you know you don't have to learn blueprint to to make a to make a level design and uh, I think it it's a good teacher. I think it's it's awesome. All right. Well, with that, I know we are we went a little bit over time, and I know our panel has to get going. So it has been a really fantastic chat. As always, I'll give each one of you a chance to kind of give your social media plugs, anything like that. So since Tomo is not here, you'll find links to his Twitter, Discord, and more information on Epic Tavern in the description down below. And Jack, where can people find out more about you? Uh, well, we're pushing our game now uh, in the black, and you can find all about it at uh, impellerstudios.com and uh, check it out. That's uh, that's kind of my my passion right now. See, get that, get that. We're we're close to a closed beta, uh, and we'll probably go early release, uh, hopefully before the end of the year, and uh, and that's where you can see it. All right, Richard. Um, yeah, for me, um, I've got two areas that you could check out in terms of joining a community where we talk about a lot of this kind of stuff and also talk about more specifically how to be successful as a game designer in this industry, not just the craft of game design. Um, and, and that is, if you search the game designer handbook um, on either LinkedIn or Facebook, you're able to find our community. Um, feel free to join and we can have deeper kind of discussions. I, I generally post uh, smaller shorts of information onto those and, and ask questions of the group and everyone kind of, uh, it's just ongoing throughout the from day to day. So it's, a, it's just a great uh, starting source for that kind of conversation. Okay. And uh, you can find me on on Discord, Twitter, and YouTube. Links will be down below. And um, come uh, check out uh, Project Riot, our current game. You know, we'll be playtesting it at some point soon on our Discord, so if you join, you can join in on the playtesting and whatnot. All right. And my information is down below as well. You can find me on Twitter at GW Bicer. If you're interested in my books, there will be links down there. And I'm currently running a acknowledgement donation. Anyone who donates $15 in the next five days will get acknowledgement in my third book. But I will be back later tonight for our regular game streaming. And hopefully our roundtable will be returning next month for another discussion. Richard, it was great meeting you for the first time tonight. And hope you enjoy the roundtable. Oh, it was great. It was great to be here. Thank you. All right. All right, everyone. That is going to do it. So, thanks for watching. Come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where we the art and science of games. Until our next discussion, have a great night. Take care.